Are we ready to go? We can just wait for people to start logging on. Okay. So maybe give it about I don't know, three minutes and then we can start. People usually start uh, saying things in the chat once they're in. Hi everyone, we're just gonna wait, uh, give some people time to log on, but thank you for joining us today. Sorry if I did that. No, <laughs> My bad. No problem. Gonna give it about a couple more minutes. Okay, Ty, do you want to get started? All right. Um, welcome to our virtual college and career visit series. My name is Taye, and I am uh, Mesa's recruitment coordinator, and we are presenting Malam to you today. So here we have um, Abby, Ada, Octavio, and Elijah, all from Malam Architects, and they'll be presenting about um, Malam today and just about opportunities for students and kind of give you a walkthrough of um, what it looks like to be an ar architect. So I'll present it over to you all. Great, thank you for having us. Um, I am Abby Dacey. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, great, and I will um, give you just a quick introduction to uh, Malam as an architecture firm, and then um, let uh, my colleagues introduce themselves. 
So uh, this is a value statement that we as an architecture firm have created for ourselves. It is that Malum envisions a world where a healthy human and environmental systems thrive. We believe community empowerment will be the game-changing force that leads to sustainable, transformational ways to make that possible. So it's an interesting statement. We're architects, we design buildings, but we don't actually say that in our value statement um, because what we really try to focus on is the impact that our buildings have, who they're designed for, and how they um, successfully help communities um, achieve their goals. We work on a variety of types of architecture. Uh, we design schools. These are photographs from some recent schools in Oregon and Washington. We also work with higher education, so college campuses, um, both um, academic buildings and uh, student housing buildings or dormitory buildings. There's some more uh, images of college buildings, including rec centers, science labs, Uh, we work on healthcare facilities. This is a clinic in North Portland. Uh, most of the healthcare we work on are smaller projects that um, allow us to really think about the clients and the people who use the space and how we can enhance their experience in healthcare. We also have worked with Native American Indian tribes in the uh, Northwestern United States, uh, designing uh, spaces of gathering, uh, spaces of education, um, or tribal groups. Um, so like I said, I'm Abby Dacey. I am an architect um, at Malem Architects. Um, I grew up here in Oregon and uh, in a smaller town. And that's one of the reasons why I like to make sure that as an architect, we come and talk to student groups who are interested in architecture because I think there's a lot of um, lack of information maybe out there. Um, and uh, it's kind of a complicated uh, insight into our profession. So. Um, I would like to um, have each of my colleagues just introduce themselves and say a little bit about um, where they're from, how they decided they wanted to become an architect, uh, maybe where they went to school, uh, something about their first job, you know, just, just an, an experience that they want to share with you. Octavio? Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Octavio Gutierrez. Uh, I actually grew up in Southern California and uh, the interesting thing is that I got interested in architecture because we lived uh, in a small house and we're a big family of seven kids. And I was always trying to figure out what was the best way to rearrange everything. So we all had the best kind of space for ourselves and carve out little spaces. So I was always tinkering and designing and trying to figure out how to be efficient with space, um, something I still do to this day. Um, but I decided, you know, pretty early on in high school that I wanted to pursue architecture and, uh, had a lot of great mentors along the way that told me to, you know, really push myself and aim high. Um, so I was actually able to go to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for my undergraduate studies uh, at MIT in Boston. Uh, had a great experience there and came back to California to go to Berkeley for graduate school uh, and got my master's in architecture there. Uh, and, uh, you know, actually started working with a contractor and then found my way back into architecture. So I've been experience with quite a few aspects of the profession and the built environment, um, but love architecture. Uh, I think we all have a passion for creating spaces that really help us, uh, you know, shape the world and help our communities shape their world the way they see it. Um, so that's that's kind of where I come from and uh, I think I'm handing it off to Ada. Hi everybody, my name is Ada Sencio. I'm actually from El Salvador. It's a small country in Central America, bordered by Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. I moved to the United States, specifically to California, as a sophomore in high school. And by that age, I already wanted to be an architect. I was actually back in my country, and we had to do an activity about building our school. And I realized the spaces that we had to do and all the little details that we had to do as a group project. And that made me think of what else we can do to improve our school. Um, I uh, got my bachelor's degree from California Polytechnic State University uh, in Pomona, also known as Cal Poly Pomona. And my first job out of school was still in California as mixed use residential. So 
there's like a lot of uh, retail on the bottom and then all residential on the top. And then I moved to Seattle about two and a half years ago and I landed in Malum, which is great. Now I'm working on schools. Um, uh, one of the things that I got to do when I was in college was to study abroad in Italy. So look for those programs when you are in college. And now Elijah. Hello everyone, I'm Elijah Coley. Uh, I grew up in central New York and went to school at um, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is also in, in central New York. Um, I got interested in architecture at a really young age. I remember um, walking around New York City on a trip with my dad and staring up at all these really ridiculously tall uh, skyscrapers and wondering how they got built, who designed them, why they even existed. And so that was kind of the first uh, little bit of inspiration for me as far as what architecture is and what it could be for me. Um, and I remember in eighth grade even doing a small um, little career kind of fair where we were discussing what we thought we wanted to do and I put down architecture. So here I am. Um, after graduating, I got my bachelor's at that school um, with a focus in sustainability. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to be able to do an internship during my fourth year of school, which was five years at RPI. Um, and I did an internship with Malum and then was lucky enough to be asked to come back full time afterwards. So this is my first job. I'm about to be wrapping up uh, my third year with the firm and I've been loving it um, every minute of it. So I'm really excited to be presenting to all of you today and I say, let's uh, continue on. So uh, I'm just gonna start. You all know we have, okay. I was just gonna say, we have three presentations we're gonna share today. Um, one is the very beginning of design, one is kind of the middle part, and then one is construction. So um, you'll hear from all of us during that time. Take it away, Elijah. Okay, so I'll be taking us through the kind of essence of a project from the beginning. And I have a napkin on the slide, not to be funny, but because a lot of the more amazing buildings that we see in, um, in the world today start as a napkin sketch. So you can see uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall in top left and the napkin sketch below it. I mean, to think that that's how that building started is pretty crazy, right? Um, so there's some other buildings there, one by Zaha Hadid in the middle, and then the Shard, which I believe is in London, um, on the right. So I think one thing that's really interesting to think about is that even these more global, um, kind of really beautiful star buildings that a lot of us architects love to look at and study, they all started from these humble beginnings of a napkin sketch. So the project that I'm sharing with you today also started from a napkin sketch. So this is one done by our design director, Ann Shaw, and it really doesn't communicate much to someone who doesn't know anything about the project, but this is really where it started. So I'll be taking you through just a little bit of the background of the project, and then I'll kind of explain how this napkin sketch became what we had ultimately presented at the interview, which won us the project. So this is the University of Bothell, University of Washington at Bothell. Um, it's also a campus that houses uh, Cascadia uh, Community College. So it's a kind of mixed campus. There's two different um, schools there. And so we, um, I think I can draw on here. So, oh, sorry, hopefully I can draw here. So our site is located right around here. Hopefully everyone can see that. And, okay, there we go. So then, um, we were lucky enough to be on the master plan of the campus as well as they thought about growing the campus. And we thought about these different guiding principles um, for the project, thinking about how do we kind of unite both of those campuses in a cohesive campus character? Um, how do we make these facilities last a long time, but also be flexible as more different types of students come in, you know, different programs are introduced. We wanted to make sure that there was a really rich um, campus experience that was created by the new buildings we create. Um, and we also wanted to think about how we can unite all of that beautiful greenery on the right side there, the forests and the kind of marsh area and make sure that people were um, enjoying uh, nature. Um, thinking about how to integrate with the city and then uh, last but not least and very important mobility access and safety. So this is what we ended up presenting at the interview. Um, those are our buildings in the front, the ones that are uh, kind of covered in brick and metal panel. And so this is kind of what came out of that napkin sketch. Pretty crazy to think about that. But um, I'm going to take you through a little bit more about what's inside each of these buildings and kind of how we set it up. 
So here's that sketch again, and this is how it relates to the building. Um, we have brick facing the uh, kind of more city side of the project. And then we have wood in the center, which is a really warm material. Um, it's going to be a really amazing thing to see when you're out hanging out on the uh, campus green or grabbing your food and sitting down with some friends. It's a, it's a beautiful material to work with. And then we capped off the ends of the project um, with metal panel to kind of create that, that transition. So around the site is a lot of this kind of dense forest, marsh, um, pond kind of aspect of the, the landscape. So we looked at these types of hints from the, from the natural landscape and tried to think about how we could um, make sure that our project was tying all of that in. So some more images here. And then this is the kind of exterior material um, palette we chose. So you can see that there's this verticality aspect of these different types of um, vertical elements replicating the trees, thinking about um, the brick, which is a, a material that's widely used in Bothell, especially on the street that we're on. And then um, thinking about how to use wood to bring back that, that aspect of the forest. Um, these are those landscape zones I was talking about. Um, we have a myriad of them and our project really wanted to blend all of them together. So we were thinking about how do we create this connection between this dense forest glade on the right side of that bottom drawing um, with the upland forest, which is again, thick, uh, tall pine trees, conifers, and really thinking about how we can bring all of that through the project and make it accessible to all these different students. The one big kind of gesture that goes through the project and through the entire campus, moreover, is what's called the promenade. Um, so this is what uh, links to all the buildings on the campus. This is probably the most used uh, path of access for a lot of the students on this campus. And our building was good. Our group of buildings, our campus was going to be the kind of end of this, uniting the city of Bothell um, to the upper left and then the rest of the campus to the bottom right in this uh, top left image. So one of the bigger things that we wanted to focus on was creating an accessible route through our campus. So this is for people who you know, are in wheelchairs and need to be able to access all these buildings without going up any stairs. So this is, um, I know you all have a project coming up where you're thinking about how to help people get over obstacles. And this is one thing that we really thought about, how do we make sure that a student can go from the city of Bothell all the way to the old campus and not have to ever take any stairs. So when you're coming from the old campus, this is the first thing you'll see from our project. Um, that building on the right is the dining hall, uh, clad in wood, these big timber beams, um, a lot of uh, CLT, which is cross laminated timber. It's where we take pieces of wood, laminate it up to create a stronger, um, larger panel. And then that gets put into the, uh, the project. So you can see that on the roof there. Um, to the left is a building that is going to, on the bottom floor, have spaces for student services. So sp spaces that, um, students can go into and get some extra help or understand things about the campus or about um, the college at, at large. A lot of the students on this campus are gonna be um, first generation students, so the first of their family. And a lot of them uh, might not know where to go for help, might not have had someone else um, in the family that's gone to college. So this is gonna be a great thing for students um, to be able to use. This is a look inside that, um, the food barn is what we're calling it, the dining hall. So a really beautiful shot of just uh, looking at how people might use the space. This is what's called a render in architecture, where we try to give an idea of what the social experience of that space is gonna be before it's ever built. So we use this in the, um, in the presentation, in the interview to kind of communicate what this space would be. And there it is a little larger for you. We've got um, some food vendors that can come in and, and put down their food. Uh, I think we had gyros in the back there, or euros if you say it that way. Um, but then it's a double height space. Um, so you can kind of see people looking down at the space, a lot of large tables for people to gather, um, do homework. And then this is a, a plan. So this is what's showing what's on the bottom level on the left and what's on the top level of that building on the right. So again, showing a lot of tables here where people can gather, um, stairs going down to the next level. In the upper left of both of the plans on here, you'll see a little bit of where the food is gonna be prepared. And so we have to think about all of that and coordinate all of that, um, even at the interview stage of a project. 
Next, we'll look at the uh, commuter lounge, which is going to be closer to the Bothell side of the project. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is where um, we're thinking about students that are coming from the city who do not live on campus in these new buildings that we're creating. Uh, the new buildings are going to be for freshmen, sophomores, and some juniors um, in the apartments. But what this space is doing is giving a spot, a landing spot for people coming off of um, a bus or another type of maybe they're biking to campus. And this is a place where they can kind of crash land, um, get themselves set for uh, the classes that are going on in the rest of the day. So this is looking at the lower levels. I think we're gonna we're gonna look at some other spaces in the buildings here. But again, this is a plan that we use to communicate what's going on at different um, heights in the building. This is one of the residential commons um, on the project, and it's in the bottom portion of this building here. So right around there, where I just drew that circle, um, and what this space is going to be communicating is where uh, a lot of the people are going to be kind of hanging out at the end of the day. Um, there's a kitchen area, there's a place to plug in and play video games, um, but it's connected to that central green that we were talking about. And you can see there's a pretty large tree in the back there. So again, bring in that nature aspect. We try to save that tree, which is existing on the campus right now. And this is a space where people can kind of transition inside, outside, um, the doors can be open in the summer, a really awesome space to hang out. So there's that existing stand of trees I was talking about, and you can see some of the existing buildings in the back there, um, which will be demolished as the new building goes up. So this is that campus green looking back to the uh, dining hall. And again, we're just trying to communicate here in this rendering the kind of activities that could be going on in the space. Um, people having picnics in the lawn, playing soccer, playing with uh, a beach volleyball, uh, all different types of activities and really creating a space where a lot of people are coming together and, and uh, congregating. Uh, so this project also needs to serve as a new campus gateway for the city of Bothell, like I was describing earlier. So we're creating spaces for buses to, to drop off people in a, in a covered uh, kind of gazebo area. And then we have bike paths and pretty large walking paths um, so that people can move around easily on our site and then get to the low larger campus. And this is what that campus gateway looks like. So two buildings here, we have the building on the right, which is the sophomore uh, uh, dormitory or residence hall. And then the building on the left is for uh, juniors and seniors uh, living in apartments. So we also thought about with the campus master plan and wanted to communicate to the to the um, university when we were giving the presentation was that we wanted to leave uh, space and connection for future growth of the campus. So we thought about um, two other buildings that could grow the campus as a whole and be another spot for students to go to for help. Um, could move offices over there for professors or for um, people who run the campus. So just trying to communicate that to the the people who were uh, we were interviewing with. And this is um, called a site plan and it's showing all the different buildings all over the site and how they relate to each other. So again, you can see that really large promenade, I'm drawing on the screen in just a second. And this is that um, accessible pathway that we were creating for people who need wheelchairs um, to be able to get through the old campus all the way through our project and get access to each one of these buildings without ever needing um, stairs. Um, these are the plans of the buildings. So we use these to kind of uh, show where all the different program is gonna be, um, program being kind of the use of the space. So you can see the red is the food service, uh, purple is that student services spaces I was talking about where kids can go for um, different types of help. And the study rooms are in green and those are kind of deeper into the buildings. People can kind of tune out the rest of the world and study. Um, common areas like the one I showed you that opens up onto that campus green. Um, the different residential units and then building support, the kind of stuff that you don't really see in the building, like um, air ducts or plumbing, um, all the different lines that have to go all over the building, they kind of land in one spot. So this is a little uh, axonometric, which is a kind of 3D drawing showing what um, the interior of one of these residential units, uh, 
residential buildings could be. So you'll see um, the different, the twos of the different types of units there, um, showing where the RA is, a little study nook where the stair connection is. So this helps people who maybe not are, maybe who aren't so familiar with what a 2D plan looks like, helps them understand a little bit more about how the space is gonna shape up. This is inside one of those um, study rooms, study lounges. And then this is a view of the apartments, looking out to that old campus in the background. And then this is what um, we kind of landed on as the final image for our interview. Um, we heard that this was definitely a selling point, um, something that they really, really enjoyed, seeing um, the campus at night, seeing it all glow up and kind of become this jewel box for them. So I'm gonna share a video that's gonna walk us through the interior spots of the project. And so I'll narrate over this, there isn't sound. Um, so this is a, a walkthrough video that I created using a program called Enscape. And it helps us look at projects um, real time uh, rendering. So rendering is kind of what I shared earlier where we're taking shots of the building and showing how they might uh, look if they're when they're actually occupied by people. So this is us walking um, through the old campus connection to the new campus that we're creating. Um, and in this program, we're able to put a lot of different things um, as far as people, different types of furniture, different types of um, landscaping, trees. We can control the sun. It's a pretty awesome program and something that I definitely have spent a lot of time in. Um, so we're pausing here to look at what um, kind of the outdoor space of that bottom level is. We can see to the right, we have some people serving some food, making some coffee. Coming upstairs, we're seeing um, an ice cream bar that has a direct connection to the campus greens. People can kind of walk up to that bar, grab some, some food, and then go back out and lay in the grass. The back space of this building is connected to the other one. So again, we're creating this spot where people can mix in the different, um, different residence halls. This is that commuter lounge. So everyone here is whipped out their laptops, getting ready to uh, start the day of classes. This is that Beardsley Boulevard to the right where um, all the buses are gonna be dropping off people that are coming to the campus from other places. And then we're heading into what we call the C store, which is kind of a grab and go coffee shop um, maybe grab a meal for the day, grab some sushi, something from those little refrigerators on the side. And then now we're looking back to um, the outdoor space on the food barn and how that connects to the campus green. So see some people congregating there. And then now we're moving into a residence hall. So we'll take a peek at one of the lounges on the bottom floor. So you can see people here gathering for, you know, maybe the big game, maybe the Huskies are playing, want to watch some football. And then as we move through here, we're seeing that large stand of trees, again, bringing nature to the project, um, really trying to create uh, a centered connection point for everyone to come to. Now we're going to go to the right over here and hop into the student services space. So this is a two-story space for the University of Washington. Um, where a lot of the people who are kind of managing the campus, managing the, the project at large, and then the community as a whole, where people can go to, um, you know, do things as far as get ready for job interviews, um, a little bit of help with classes, all sorts of that, those types of things. And on the bottom floor, we have another lounge space. This is for not only the people working in the building, but for students to come and hang out and use. Um, presentation areas for giving um, presentations or group projects. And then what we're gonna do here is uh, a little aerial fly, like we're like a crow, and look back at the project as it changes from day to night. This is probably my favorite part of the video just because of uh, the way it turned out. I think it was really cool. And that's where we ended. So yeah, that was me taking you through uh, our interview process. And I'm gonna turn it back over to the slide deck and we'll head on to the next presentation.
Great. Thanks, Elijah. That was awesome. Um, uh, Elijah presents a very large project to you. Um, actually, I helped out with that project too. Um, I want to say there's maybe 10 people at its peak. Um, and now that it's a real project, there's probably more than that. Um, so projects can be very large or they can be pretty small. And what I'm going to share with you next is actually one of those smaller projects that we like to do. Uh, and Abby described, you know, these small projects that really let us get in touch with the communities we serve. Uh, this was a renovation of a historic theater in Camas, Washington, so just just across uh, the Columbia River. Um, and we started that project by, you know, they brought us in to look at how we could bring this community asset back to life. It was an old historic theater uh, that was part of the original Garfield High School in Camas, and over time, portions of the building got removed, uh, other pieces were added. And really, the, the character of the theater had been kind of changed over time to the point where, you know, it was still there. It still had some beautiful details and some nice things that were worth preserving. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there was a lot of additions to the project that made this project uh, no longer really feel like the community asset that the community was envisioning here. Uh, I pause at this photo here because you can see, you know, talking about removing barriers, the idea in the 80s of getting somebody in a wheelchair into the entrance of the theater involved cutting through a landscaped area and zigzagging through some stairs to enter kind of this red hut element uh, towards the left of the image there and then coming through to enter uh, the same lobby that everyone else could just walk up a few set of stairs. So there were accessibility issues. The building was at, at a point where it might not survive a major earthquake. So there was a lot of reasons to try to come back uh, and try to renovate and improve uh, some of the features for the building to make this something that the community could use again. Uh, so with that, I think Abby was gonna talk a little bit about the community engagement. If Abby, do you wanna jump in here if you've got audio? Yeah, um, yeah I know that in your projects, each of you got a chance to I think interview a real client um, and that is something we do a lot in our work. Um, so we spend time thinking about who we need to talk to and what are some of the best ways to get information from them. So these are all um, images from evening meetings that we held uh, with the district. And as you can see, there was a lot of different activities. There was writing on big paper, there was doing kind of um, note cards, people voting with different colored dots, um, people explaining their ideas. Um, you know, sharing photographs and letting them react to them. So lots of different ways to elicit feedback. Um, so it just, it's, it's a really interesting part of our process and something we really like to do because that's where we hear the priorities. Um, and priorities were really important for this project because we had a very small budget and we had to be able to do as much as possible that would help as many, help as many people in the community have access to theater, musical theater, dance, um, you know, musical performance space. Um, and if you are involved in any of those um, those activities, you know that they all have different performance requirements. So we had to see how we could meet as many of those as possible uh, on our budget. Yeah, so everyone that Abby described um, that we were meeting with, you know, has a stake in the project, right? They're stakeholders is what we like to call them um, because this project's important to them um, and they help shape the vision. So. Uh, part of some of the decisions we made with that group were deciding how much of the historic older building were we actually going to try to save and what were we going to try to bring back. So the diagram that's on the screen now shows, uh, uh, you know, in the darker pink color, all the pieces of the building that were going to come off. So those were going to be demolished and removed uh, to make way for some of the improvements. Um, if you recall from some of the photos, you know, the, the part of the building that faces south, so we call that the south elevation, uh, had a bunch of windows filled in in the 70s when they thought that was gonna be more energy efficient. But, you know, nowadays we have better glass and, you know, the technology can allow us to have more glazing and allow us to create these great views out. So we wanted to put more windows back in. And I say more really the original windows that were there in the 30s uh, to really help connect with nature and create those views back towards town. So this was everything we were gonna remove. We were gonna remove an old classroom wing that was added on. We were gonna remove a, you know, that convoluted entry I described earlier on. Um, and we also wanted to make it very clear what we were gonna put back in. 
So we wanted to create a whole new entry sequence that was much easier to navigate for somebody in a wheelchair. We wanted, we wanted the entry to be much more identifiable. We wanted it to feel like, you know, as you're approaching the site, the entry is something you see uh, very easily so that the community feels like it's a place where they belong. Um, but really, for the most part, this was a very limited budget, so we couldn't do a whole lot more to add to it. We had to be really respectful uh, of the budget uh, because this was being funded by taxpayers, right? They passed a bond to help fund some of this work. So uh, everything we do has to be responsible to the taxpayers and to the, the people that approve the bond. So we had to be very careful with what we were adding back in uh, to make sure we were uh, using the budget wisely. So this is a view of that same exterior elevation, that south facing elevation, showing some of those new windows put back in. So again, opening that up a lot more. Uh, and again, looking at that new entrance uh, from the roadway, right? You would pull it in your car and immediately know kind of where you wanna walk in and, and what's going on inside. So you, uh, just like we saw with the previous project that Elijah presented at night, when you're having a performance, this whole thing would glow through all those windows and you'd see kind of some excitement coming up and down those stairs. So kind of bringing some of that theater activity and excitement out to the street was one of the goals for this entry. And then once we were inside, we had, you know, different floor levels that were just layered on top of each other like a pancake, classroom above classroom above classroom. And for the top two floors, we thought it would be really exciting if we could remove some of those classroom spaces to create this double story, two story volume that's just outside the theater. So that before a performance, you might be able to hang out here and, you know, mingle. Um, but this space was also flexible enough that, you know, if you were to clear out all the furniture, you could imagine a, a group of high school or junior high school dance students practicing, right? We wanted to bring out the wood floor and make all of these spaces flexible and do double duty so that they could function as, you know, this space where you wait for a performance, but also a classroom space. So trying to do as much as we can with that limited budget. And then once we got to the inside of the theater, uh, you know, there was not a whole lot to do here other than to refinish surfaces, uh, bring in new seats, uh, what we like to call a fluff and buff, where we're kind of cleaning things up and polishing them up and making it look fresh again. Um, but really this, this project, we want to share it because it's one that, you know, went through a, a design phase. We've taken it through construction documents. So what you're seeing now is actually a, a, a sheet, a drawing from something we would call a construction drawing set. And these are the essentially the instructions that we provide to a contractor. So if architects are designing, we're creating the instructions or the recipe, we hand it off to the contractor and they're gonna put this thing together. So when we're taking our designs and translating that to construction documents, we're trying to be as detailed and as careful as possible in trying to explain everything we need the contract contractor to do in order to make sure that the building ends up the way we intended it to be designed. So uh, the drawing on the on the screen now shows a demolition plan showing how some areas were, were going to be removed. Uh, but we also had detailed floor plans that had you know a whole lot of information about you know dimensions. How far should one wall be from another wall? Where should you locate a window? You know what is the slope of a ramp? You know how how big should this restroom be? So we're, these are very detailed instructions and you probably can't see all the detail here on my screen, but a lot of it's just, you know, taking a contractor from one part of a drawing to maybe another set of the drawing where, you know, you might go from a floor plan, which is what I was showing a second ago, uh, and back to an elevation. So this might show you what that same building looks like if you were to look at it flat. So, you know, if you think of a square building like a cake, you know, each floor plan is a layer of that cake and the faces of the cake are the elevations. So we use those elevations. Uh, we use cardinal directions, so north, south, east, west. So we'll put certain elevations on one sheet. So you can see the different sides of the cake on the different uh, sheets that we're sharing here. Um, and as part of those instructions, you know, we have to show some very detailed information. Um, this is just a standard assembly sheet. So an assembly is essentially different pieces of a building coming together. And in this case, they're wall assemblies. So what? how do you build a wall together, right? It's probably got 
a structural piece like a wood stud in there and it's probably got some drywall or sheetrock on either side and some insulation to to you know cut out some sound it might have to resist fire um so that's the kind of information level of detail we would put in a sheet like this that would show some assemblies um but the goal of putting these documents together is to create that really uh detailed set of instructions, right? To minimize the number of questions that the contractor might have uh, during construction. They're still gonna have them, you know, Otto will tell you that they still have lots of questions and that's part of the exciting part of uh, looking at your project get built. Um, and that's pretty much where this project is now. It's, uh, I wanna say about halfway through construction. Uh, this was taken late last year uh, and it should be open for performances, fingers crossed, this fall, uh, assuming we can all be back in buildings and watching performances. So uh, I think with that, I would like to hand it off to Ada to talk about construction administration. Thank you, Octavio. That was a really great way to explain construction documents. And once we have this really big set of construction documents or like instructions so that we can hand off to the contractor. Now the contractor is going to try to put everything together or bake the cake. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about construction administration and currently I'm working on a project that is three school additions who are under construction right now. However, they are not that far along. They're almost getting into the finishes, but not yet. So I wanted to show you a project that was more complete so you can see more of a how the, how the process is and how the whole building comes together. For this, I'm gonna to talk to you about Kellogg Middle School, which is located in Shoreline, Washington. And this is the rendering image of the design intent that we had at the beginning of the, of, of the project. Elijah, Avi, and Octavio had done a great job at explaining the design process and how these ideas come together and all the um, baking or like the putting together all the instructions. And Kellogg Middle School is north of Seattle, as you can see. And on the left side, you're going to see Kellogg Middle School is also surrounded by a high school and two elementary schools. And that drawing right now has the, um, the what it was Kellogg Middle School. So we wanted to do is pretty much flip where the track is move it south that way all of the sport activities could be along one way and as you can also as you also saw from the previous slide it was very surrounded by nature so we wanted to bring that nature and that calm and all of the imagery inside to the elementary school this is a floor plan of the elementary of, of middle school and on the top right, it would be the entry. And this floor plan, you can also call it a loop or a donut, if you might want to say, where you walk around in like a circle from all the rooms. So you start in the administration, so in a very secure area where um, a lot of um, administration, the, uh, the principals and teachers can have direct uh, view to the students. And you sort of walk around to some of the classrooms, go keep going around to other classrooms. You're going to see you can come back out to the courtyard and then south to where all the sports activities are. And if you come up to the second level, it's the same thing. You can have the, the south where the sport activities are. There's a floating bridge or the floating library, how we call it, uh, which is the green box in the middle there that has great views on both sides to the interior courtyard and also to the uh, exterior part that is like right next to it. So this image here is pretty awesome. This is what it was, Kellogg Middle School, and you can see that existing building there, and then how it starts transforming into what we wanted it to be. So now you can see there the demolition process, um, the, the track went down, and once the track was out, um, the middle school was able to use the high school adjacent <laughs> for PE. And you can start seeing the new school coming together. Now you can start seeing the old school beginning to be demolished and almost finished. So how do we get there? Demolition. 
<laughs> we start off by demolition, obviously, and prepping the site so that we can begin to transform this new school. And you can start seeing there's a lot of equipment and you know and tractors that we can to prep prep the ground. Um, we for this specific school the the site wasn't stable enough, so we had to do what is called aggregate piers. So you see that big machine right there. What it's doing, it's um, pretty much carving these gigantic holes and filling them up with aggregates so that the ground can be more stable, so that it can support the weight of the building. And this is for this whole process, we also coordinate with a lot of consultants, meaning we coordinate with your civil engineers, structural engineers, you know, electrical, mechanical. So we work together as a team. So whenever you take a test online that says, what do you want to do when you grow up? And it's like, do you like to work in a group? Yes, <laughs> that's something that we always do. Now you can start seeing the foundation and um, buildings need to be very secure. So now you can, you can see here how the foundations here are very deep, carving out all the ground so that you can start putting um, kind of like a, how do you, how do you explain it? But so like in concrete can go, so you start framing out all the boxes so you can start putting the concrete. Um, this is an example of consultant coordination. There's a lot of things going on underground, all the electrical that needs to go on the ground, your plumbing pipes, and all the utility, utilities, for example, like some cable lines and things like that can go on the ground. So all of those pipes hold some of those things. And since this is a brand new school and a pretty big school, you can see everything that's going underground. Now you can start seeing um, concrete being poured for the foundation. You can start seeing now the slab and grade. Here's our project architect, Emily. And once the slab and grade is on place, now we can start building up. And here you can start seeing some of the metal framing coming together. And now you start seeing the, the, the whole school taking um, shape. And it starts getting very exciting. I think this is my favorite part of construction, trying to see these still together. Um, the, all the underground and everything, it's pretty fun to see. But I think this is my favorite part because that's when you actually start seeing the project coming together and taking shape. For all of this um, metal framing, the just as we put together a whole, a whole set of instructions on where walls go and everything, every little detail, the structural engineer also puts a whole set of <laughs> instructions for where all the pieces of metal are going and framing. You can see it coming together here. Um, and we wanted to bring that um, wood and natural elements into the school. So we started using um, some DLT, which is dowel laminated lumber inside and some glue lamps and you can start seeing coming together. And you wanted to bring those big pieces of wood in the main um, spaces like the library, the commons and the entry areas. After metal framing, you can start seeing more of the framing coming in, filling in the walls. You also have this yellow area that you that you see on the walls. Those are um, sheeting, pretty much is wrapping the wall, but it's also protecting it from water. So you can start seeing it right there because, I mean, if, if, as you can see here in the Pacific Northwest, it rains a lot, so we need to protect this build, the buildings from from all the rain and all the cold weather. And now you can start seeing some of the interior images and how it's coming together. And this big ducts right there, those are co we coordinate those during the construction or design process with our mechanical engineers. That way they are not clashing with any of the beams or any of the electrical and things like that. Um, stairs are pretty cool to look at once they come together. This is these are the stairs for the main commons area, which with a space where um, the students can congregate and also there's like a, a cafeteria towards the end. 
you can start to see it coming together even more. And same thing, if you look up into what is the, the roof area, you can start seeing all those pipes for any electrical conduit, as well as um, our sprinklers in case of a fire. And now here you can start seeing all the other stuff coming together. Some details of the railings, which we also draw. Now you can see here's more of the interior framing as well. And uh, the little black box right there is just for um, clock or speaker for within the classrooms. You can start seeing now that the wrapping in the walls are coming together as well. Big mechanical duct in the spaces so that the spaces are very well ventilated and it's comfortable for you to be inside the classrooms. Um, you can start seeing those little boxes too on the picture on the right. Those are for electrical um, fixtures and and you also start seeing now that the, the walls are coming more wrapped in together. So slowly you can you start seeing the building getting dressed up. This little metal framings are for the for our ceilings. There's space in between the big pieces of metal and this one so that everything that you don't like to see, the all the mechanical ducts and electrical and all those pipes can be hidden between those layers of, of the building. That way, when the building is finished, you can all see the pretty pictures. Insulation coming in so that you can be nice and comfortable and warm during the cold weather. And you can see more of the stairs coming in and how the stairs look once they're almost finished as well. Just some pictures on how once the windows are coming in as well. the spaces. This is now you can see the interior elements are coming together and this is a gym area. So now we're putting more equipment. You see accessible hooks now on the wall pads. And those are things that we all coordinate. We have interior elevations where we start, where we say where the wall pads are going. We have elevations where, where we say and um, where all the hoops are going as well. Now we get the bleachers. And um, the paddings on the walls that you see, there are the beige and whitish color. Um, those are for sound. Since the, in the gym you, you scream, you play, you cheer. Now you can start seeing classrooms coming together casework, um, the teaching walls and all the cubbies. We also do uh, elevations and details or, or how those come together as well. You can see the in one of the interior hallways. More of the gym coming together. And now I'm taking you back outside, you already got sort of the feel of the interior of the building. So back outside, you now we're back into the main metal framing structure. You're starting to dress it up and having um, the exterior sheeting with waterproofing and you can start seeing those little green Seekers that we call, <laughs> and those hold the exterior insulation together as well as they create a little gap so that they, the building can breathe as well. And you can start seeing that insulation coming in on the picture on the left. And this is um, how the, that interior a view to that interior courtyard. You can start seeing how the building is becoming more insulated and the installation of the metal panel. The picture on the right, you can actually see how the whole building was actually put together. You can see that yellow board that we've been looking everywhere. Then you have those little green seekers 
And, and then we have that C piece that you see in the middle, and that's what's holding up the metal panel towards the wall. And um, the piece of metal in the duct, even those not so much fun parts of the building, that is a downspout. <laughs> so if <laughs> those not exciting parts of the buildings, we actually do have to locate and see where they go. In this case, we wanted to hide them. So you can see on the picture to the left, you don't see any downspouts. And this is how we're coming. This is how the school is looking now. We also work with landscape architects who help us do um, all the landscape of our schools and our projects. In this case, we use a lot of native plants. And this is one of the renderings of that commons area where uh, students can congregate during lunch or between classes. And I'm going to show you sort of what the idea was and how this space comes together. So you can start seeing on our um, on our right, we have our design intent, and on the left, we actually took a picture every week to see how the, the, the space was coming together. And here you can start seeing more of the, the wood coming in, the stairs are starting to coming together. You can see the concrete for the stairs have been poor, and now you can see the smaller stairs starting to be built. The walls are um, getting all the insulation. Now you start seeing more of the finishes on the walls. Now those walls are looking, are looking better. And you can start seeing all of the electrical lighting um, coming in as well, all the, um, the acoustic panels, which will help with the noise since kids there can be, you know, you're talking, you're laughing, you're chatting. So this helps with balance all of all of that noise. Now you start seeing um, the concrete floor being cleaned and getting all nice. And this is how it looks right now. This is a view of the share learning areas we like to do in our, in our school projects, a share learning area so that every four or so many classrooms can have actually a spot where they can come outside in the hallway and have another extra uh, space where they can um, do other activities. And this is how it's looking now. This is our design, design intent for the entry lobby. And how it looks now. Our library bridge. During construction, you can see we brought in um, those wood elements as well. And this is how it looks now. And it looks it has great views for both the exterior and um, and the interior courtyard as well. The exterior courtyard, you can see that library in the background. And this is on the other side of the library for the other view. And I think that was what I have. Cut me a slice of that cake. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, construction can take anywhere from a year to two years or even longer on really complicated projects. So um, it's always exciting to see projects bake as uh, Otto put it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what you all can do now if, if a career in architecture is something that interests you. I mean, there's a whole lot you can be doing. You're doing one thing right now, which is you're listening to a bunch of architects talk about architecture. Um, and I would say, stay curious, right? Uh, ask architects if you ever see them, you know, why Why do you do what you do? What, what makes you motivated? Why did you choose your career? Uh, you're going to get a lot of different answers, but I think it's also going to give you an insight into all of the great stuff that you can do as an architect. Um, and aside from that, there's a lot of great programs. Um, MACE was one of them, but others that you can start to look at as you, you know, graduate from one year to the next in school. Um, one of the Ones that jumps to mind for somebody who might be in anywhere from sixth grade to 12th grade uh, is through the National Organization of Minority Architects, which is also known as NOMA. 
they have something called a, a project pipeline and they put on a summer camp every August. Um, so that's something that, you know, for a whole week, you can get, get involved and figure out what it's like to actually do architecture. Uh, and then once you're in high school, there's a few other programs. Uh, here in Portland, we have uh, something called the ACE Mentorship Program, which is, ACE stands for Architecture, Construction, and Engineering. Um, so in 11th and 12th grade, you can uh, apply to the program and get to actually, for 16 weeks, be an architect, a contractor, and an engineer on a real project and really understand what it's like to, to do something. Uh, a couple other high school programs. Um, here in Portland, we have Camp ELSO, uh, E-L-S-O, and that stands for Experience Life Science Outdoors. Uh, and they try to promote STEM uh, or STEAM uh, out there. And they actually do one program called Your Street, Your Voice, uh, which is really exciting because it's also you know, for high school students, but it lets you uh, imagine how you can take over part of your community and really do that community-driven design. Um, I think the last thing I wanna point out is uh, the Portland Workforce Alliance does their Northwest Youth Careers Expo every spring. Uh, so that's, I think, coming up next month, uh, and they put on a great career fair where you can actually see and talk to a whole lot of architects. Uh, we're usually there, but you'll see other architects there too, and you can talk to them and ask about careers in architecture uh, or careers in contracting, construction, engineering, um, really all of these different disciplines that are part of the uh, process of making a building come to life. So. Uh, happy to answer more in the Q&A, uh, but with that, I think Abby's going to take us to the last piece of the agenda, which is the pathway to architecture. Uh, yeah, thanks, Octavio. Um, so if you think you're interested in architecture, um, there's just a few things I guess we'd like to kind of help put in your in your mind. Um, like I said, I know I found when I was interested in being an architect that my guidance counselor didn't know how to do this and my parents didn't know how to do this. So um, I had to ask a lot of questions and um, do a lot of research to find out. Um, so the main thing for the path to become an architect is that you need to go to an accredited university or school. In Oregon, those are Portland State University and University of Oregon. Uh, there are many other schools um, in the country as well, um, but that's just something to keep in mind um, looking for an accredited program. Um, I'm not going to go into all the detail here, but there's several different routes to becoming an architect. Uh, you can go straight from high school to college, and it takes five years where you can get a degree that allows you to become a licensed architect. You can also go from high school to college and get a degree in anything you want, English, you know, science, um, engineering, anything, and then you can get a graduate degree that allows you to become an architect. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of flexibility there. I think the one thing to keep in mind is if you know you want to be an architect, um, getting just like an accreditation, say at PCC, like through drafting or something like that, that will not allow you to become a licensed architect. You'll still have to go to college. Um, but like Octavia said, you know, the things you can do now in your education, whether you're in middle school or high school, do creative things, uh, draw, draw with your hand, uh, draw with a computer, um, you don't have to learn any specific program. You don't have to learn how to draft. Uh, you don't even have to be all that good at math, even though people will tell you that. Uh, we don't actually use very much math, um, and we have computer programs and things and engineers who help us with that. Um, anything you can do to make, paint, sew, sculpt, um, any of that will help you. Um, and doing programs like this, you know, getting um, having conversations with people, understanding how space affects them. Um, those are all things that will help um, build your skills and uh, maybe help you understand if you really do like the idea of architecture. Um, you know, you're also welcome to knock on our door once we're back in our offices and uh, you know, take a tour of our space. We're gonna show you uh, a glimpse of our space now and show you a little bit about uh, how we work in an architecture firm. And I think we can start to show that and answer questions at the same time. Is that my cue, Abby, to take us to the office? All right. So let's let's transport ourselves to Southeast Portland. Um, let's see. 
but normally why he's why he's getting that set up, I'll just explain, you know, normally we would receive you in our office and we would take you on a tour. We would show you these projects firsthand. Um, but we have been out of our offices since March and we're all working from our own homes, um, which has been definitely a challenge, as you know, as students. Um, but we have a very beautiful space that really helps us work um, much more collaboratively and I think probably in a more fun setting than we get to work from our homes. Um, yeah, so I've transported you to our office. If you were an architect working at Malum, you would come in through this door and you'd have your kitchen here where you could grab your cup of coffee and drop off your lunch in the fridge. Uh, but really we wanted our front space which we call the, the Marvel community room, to be really open, welcoming, have a lot of daylight. Uh, we designed this space, uh, gosh, about two and a half years ago now and moved in a year and a half ago, even though we've only been, we were there for about three months and then we all went remote. Uh, but this space has been uh, very, working very well for us, um, you know, if you're in this community space, there's places to have your lunch or to have an informal conversation around these couches. If you're a member of the public and you're visiting us, you would come in through these doors that are kind of clad in wood. So this was all done in reclaimed wood. So wood that was salvaged uh, and reused as shelving and door cladding. So you would come in as a member of the public through these doors. Uh, and you would walk in and immediately be greeted by our fabulous receptionist, Julio. Uh, and really, when you walk in, you get a whole glimpse of the entire office and just how open it is and how much daylight uh, we're bringing in. So we do a lot of work, uh, you know, in teams. So we've got some conference rooms. Uh, so you can see the room here with the big windows just to the left of the reception area. That's, that's our largest conference room. And it could probably hold about 16 people, 20 people in a pinch. But if all 50 of us in Portland are meeting, we're probably meeting in this space, which is that larger community room. And we all uh, fit here quite nicely. Uh, it's where we have our parties and where we get together and celebrate. Uh, and the other half of our office is where, it's where work gets done. I mean, some work gets done in, in the kind of fun space too, but uh, this is where all of our computers uh, are located. So we all sit in rows. So we made a conscious decision when we moved to this office that we were gonna sacrifice some desk space. So you can see uh, we've got about six feet of space. So just about as much as you can, can almost touch your neighbor's fingers if you stretch. If you're Elijah and you're tall, you can probably touch your neighbor, uh, but I have a few inches to spare. Um, so we like to arrange ourselves in teams so that we can sit efficiently, but then we also have these great team rooms uh, where we can actually come together and have conversations as a team. And we each have a computer and a whiteboard, so a big wall that we can write on and we can pin up, we can bring our kids and they can draw on our boards too, that's always fun. Uh, but each project will have a different team space and we'll be able to go back and forth between our desk and our team space as we see fit during our day. Um, so we have about five of these different team spaces. Um, we share those team spaces between projects, but really it's, it's, a, it's a compact footprint for our workspace. Um, we really wanted to make sure that there was more space for the community, more space for our teams, uh, and really make it so that we could, you know, force a lot of interaction. So we're always crossing back and forth through this walkway. You hear a lot of activity. You can hear conversations next to you, uh, which is exciting. Um, but we do have some smaller rooms if you do need to have you know, a more private conversation. You can uh, sneak into a phone room in one of these smaller areas. Uh, and I've walked over to our materials library, which when we did this walkthrough, it was still getting populated. So it's still a little bare, but now it's full of materials and it's where we lay out different samples. We've got some beautiful skylights up above. Where are they? They're here somewhere. Yeah. So they bring some great daylight down here so we can see materials the way you would see them in real life. So we can examine different shades of brick, carpet, paints, and kind of put all the pieces together when we're assembling our instructions to make, to make sure that everything's gonna look good uh, in real life. Um, yeah, this is another way to enter our office. It's where we hang up our coats and leave our muddy shoes and kind of walk back to the office and get our work done. So that's a, 
a quick tour of our office. Um, and I think we are happy to answer questions now. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, we have questions in the chat. So um, the audience members can go ahead and type it in the Q&A portion, um, the Q&A tab, and um, you can go ahead and upvote any questions you like. So the first question we have here is, what do you see as an advantage to being an architect over being a structural engineer? Wants to take that one. Well, me? Go ahead, Elijah. I've got that stuff. Well, <laughs> sure. Uh, I was actually thinking about um, structural engineering kind of right before I decided to commit to architecture. And one reason is because I really love math and physics. Um, but I think one of the benefits uh, for architecture is that you actually get to start designing and shaping how the overall structure looks. And you can really put that kind of artistic touch on it to say, this is how I, this is the colors I want. This is the, the texture of the walls. This is how I want everything to come together. So I think that was really something I really wanted to create sculpture that just lasted forever, right? That's kind of like the, the dream of mine. So that's why I chose architecture over structural engineering. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Elijah. I would say the structural engineer is the, uh, Obviously, the person who puts everything together, the structural elements, you know, of the entire building, but we're the ones who design how it looks, the aesthetics, where everything goes. So if you like more of the artistic side of it, um, I would say architecture. But if you really are into math and uh, figure out building structures, our structural engineers are really fantastic. They also help us out. You. Um, sizing every, everything, they have to calculate, make sure that all the columns are the right size so the building doesn't fall. So it is a combination of the two. Well, I, I wanted to answer that by saying structural engineers are my best friends. I, I really do love structural engineers because without them, uh, you know, we can't do really cool stuff. And they understand gravity, right? Things fall. Uh, and they will help us make sure things don't fall and that things stand up and that we can do really creative things. Um, and a really good structural engineer understands space just the way we do. Um, you can pursue structural engineering with the mindset that you want to shape space just the way we we're talking about architecture. Because structural engineers that I love are very passionate about space too. And I think it's it's a great marriage of two disciplines. and. I love working with them and I think they're both great, um, but I echo what Ada and I, Elijah said about um, architecture. Awesome. And another question here, are there any paid internships, either high school or college, or what can students be doing? So I put one in um, the q and I think earlier, which is um, the city of Portland runs a program called Summer Works. And it is a short, I think it's about a 10 week program in the summer where there are various um, opportunities to get paired with a professional firm. Um, some of those are available in architecture. Our office has hosted interns through that program before, but they're also um, some of the companies involved in that are engineering firms, accounting firms, all sorts of different things. But that might be a place to look. Um, I think it's available for youth, like 16 to 22. Um, and then in college, there are sometimes paid internship opportunities. Um, the more common thing in college would be that you would do a um, like a practicum or a, um, where you're getting college credit to work in an architecture office. So that's what Elijah was describing when he first came to Balaam. He was doing something like that. Yeah, I would want to add to that that uh, there are certain colleges, for example, Cal Poly Pomona, where I went to, they pair up your IDP hours, which in order to become an architect, you also have to work a certain amount of hours in all these different areas that we described today, design development, construction documents, uh, construction administration, and some of the universities will let you um, do those hours as an internship and actually count those hours for um, becoming an architect. Awesome. Um, another question we have is how long did it take for you to get the idea of um, the projects? It, it, uh, 
it sometimes depends. Sometimes you're, you have to think fast. Um, I like, it's, it's interesting because some of my ideas have come like in the shower, right? It's not, it's not a joke. <laughs> you're, you're not even thinking about work and then all of a sudden you think of something or I'm on a run and all of a sudden, wow, that's what I need to do. And then you like run back home and it's like start drawing it. So ideas can happen at any time. It can happen very quickly. Um, I think the best ideas are really driven by a vision. So I think ideas don't happen in, an, in a vacuum, right? You've got to have project goals and a project vision that then gets your mind thinking about ideas. Um, and then those ideas become buildings. So there's there's definitely a, a process that's involved, which is why I say it, it's hard to tell, but sometimes that light bulb, light bulb clicks on at 2 a.m. Um, I would say for the for the project that I presented, I know that we started the campus master plan, I think that was 2017. Um, I actually was part of that as an intern uh, at Malum. And then to see it come full circle, you could tell that's a pretty long stretch of time. It's almost three years. And I still think that, you know, there were aspects of that project that were taken from the 2017 work. And then, you know, the interview process, the prep for that probably took maybe four months. I'm not sure, I probably would probably know better, but pretty long time to get that level of detail together to kind of wow the, the people we were trying to get the project from. Awesome, thank you. Um, Tamara asks, do you draw your designs by hand or do you use a computer? Both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I threw a little answer in there. We use both. Um, I said maybe more hand drawing in the conceptual phases of the project, but I mean, we sketch out things through all phases of the project. Uh, I've worked on construction administration and still was sketching things out um, for contractors. So we draw by hand and computer throughout the entire life of the project. Yeah, I want I want to add that you know, for architects, drawing is a way of communicating. So it's how we communicate those instructions to others. So. Um, you can communicate in so many ways. We also build physical models. Um, the drawings that we showed you were flat, like some of them are 2D drawings, but we can also draw in three dimensions and create models, just like you saw with the fly through that Elijah showed you. So these are all communication tools that we can use. Um, I've seen students in my ACE programs communicate with Minecraft. So if you think space is cool and want to play with it, play with it in Minecraft. That's another way to communicate space. So what does a license allow you to do as an architect? That's another question we have in the chat. Um, well, a license is not required um, to work in an architecture firm, but it is required um, to sign drawings and stamp drawings. So certain types of buildings of certain sizes, you're required to be a licensed architect um, to work on them. So if you were working by yourself, you would have to have your license. Um, I, so for example, at Malum, all of us work on projects. Um, only a few people who are the most senior leaders of the firm are actually the ones who are signing and stamping the drawings. Um, however, most of us are licensed and we do that for a few reasons. Um, it shows that we have the education um, and the training and, the, and that we do continuing education and we keep up our experience. So it shows that we're um, invested in our, our education. Um, and then I would say most architecture firms also um, require you essentially to get a license in order to um, be promoted uh, within the firm. So to receive um, maybe more leadership roles. So it's um, in many ways, it's just an outward example of um, how, how much you've worked <laughs> and, and how much you've studied um, to make sure that you know um, how to take the responsibility for the work that you do. Um, because fundamentally, while architecture, everything we showed you was really fun and very cool, uh, we are also responsible for life safety. So a lot of, you know, the, the core of what we do is making sure that people can get out of buildings safely, that buildings don't fall down on top of them, um, that they can move around safely. If somebody's in a wheelchair, that they can adequately move through a space. Um, so a lot of those things are kind of requirements. and you got to make sure you understand what all those are um, so you can apply those to buildings. Because um, while it looks really fun, there's also kind of a serious side to it. 
Yeah, and Abby, I think we should add that, you know, a building generally cannot be built unless it's been designed by an architect and has that stamp. So um, generally you can't just go and build something. It needs to be designed and that, that stamp, that architecture license is proof that somebody was responsible for that process. So our next question is, is it easier to draw your designs by hand or computer? So like which one would be more simpler to do? That's a trick question. <laughs> um, I know that I am much better at drawing things in the computer than I am by hand, but I still have to do both. So um, it kind of all comes down to who you are as a person. And if you are super artistic and you drew a lot in high school or maybe when you were younger. Um, but I know that my school definitely taught me a lot of how to draw with the computer. And so that's kind of what I, I like to do. That's my bread and butter. All right. Um, Daniel asks, what are some of your most rewarding moments of your work? I think I'm going to go with a well, personal experience. And um, I was out and I, I met someone that their kids are going to go to Caleb Middle School, which is the school that I showed you. And uh, my fiance was like, oh yeah, uh, she was part of the design team for Caleb Middle School. And this person was so excited and so happy and he and he said, oh my goodness, thank you so much. The school is so great. I am so happy with the new amenities. My kids are so excited to go there. They actually want to go to school. So I think, seeing that from the people outside of our office and seeing that that the people that we're designing for are very excited and happy for the space that we're de designing. Um, it's very rewarding for us. I think that's like the gold medal. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I'd like to add to that um, because for me, it, it's two things, right? It's the relationships that you build along the way that's really rewarding for me. Um, and those relationships primarily with, with our clients, the people who are who we're designing our, our work for and seeing them just glowing with happiness when they're cutting that ribbon, when that project's done, because it's a long process. And for them, it's a lot of money and invested invested time in this process. So to be there with them when they're finally, you know, it's like getting the keys to your new car. For them, it's like getting the keys to the new house or to the new school um, and just being, being there for them uh, and being for the, there for them afterwards too, because pro projects still have a life after they uh, take over, just like your car still needs service after you buy it. So, um, yeah. Great. Um, another question we have is, if I wanted to start learning uh, to use a computer program for drawing, what are some good options to try? I threw a little answer in there. Um, I said SketchUp because they have a web version now that's pretty easy to use. I've used it a couple of times when I just needed to, like Octavio, just get an idea down and make sure I understood what I was even thinking about. Um, but I think SketchUp is a great place to start if you can. I've, I've definitely had that um, be used in some of the summer camps that I've helped with. So um, it's definitely accessible for people who don't know much about drawing in 3D. And another one is Tink Tinkercad. Uh, which is kind of like SketchUp, but it's a little different. So that, and I think that's also free. Thank you. Um, um, okay, so our next question is, how does the concept of sustainability come into your work as an architect? So like, think about how much you can drive, which materials are used. It comes in everywhere. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we didn't talk about that much on the projects that we showed, um, but it is very much a part of how we approach every single project that we design. In fact, our office space that we were showing you um, has received a living building pedal challenge certification, which mean, um, means that we followed all of the requirements of the living building challenge um, for the materials that we used in the project. So we had to think really, really deeply about where every material came from, what it was made out of, how it uh, affects the people around it, if it has chem chemicals in it, if it off gases, um, how it's produced, how it was transported to the site, just a 
whole list of things. Um, and so that is one aspect. Um, you know, the Garber project that Octavia showed you is a adaptive reuse or reuse of an old building, which is a very sustainable thing to do because otherwise um, we, you know, we're reusing a lot of the original structure, a lot of the original pieces of that project. And obviously we're adding new things to it, but we're not adding as much as we would if it was a brand new building. Um, it also impacts types of windows we use, how much insulation. You saw Ada's presentation. She was showing all the insulation on the outside of the building. We use a lot of insulation these days. It's like wearing a really warm coat. Um, it, I mean, it impacts the fact that we use a lot of natural light in our spaces. Um, in fact, I'm working on a building right now that has um, entirely natural ventilation in it, so it can heat and or cool itself um, without a uh, running air conditioning system. Um, so it's, it's kind of in everything that we do, and uh, there's a lot of different solutions out there, but we have to stay pretty up on um, all those opportunities. Thank you so much. So just a reminder um, to the students, um, you guys can go ahead and ask your questions in the Q&A uh, tab. So if you click on that, you can ask it in the gray, in the gray section. Um, and so then your questions can be seen. We just have a few more. Um, so how often do you have to change your plans and what are some of the most common reasons you have to change your plans? All the time. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like every day. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I can give an example of like, you're even changing things in construction, right? Sometimes you'll be building some, something's getting built like on the Garber Theater, for example. Um, and because there was a, a renovation, uh, they discovered something in removing a portion of the old building that we didn't know was there. And all of a sudden we need to change the, the design again. Um, so a lot of times it's, it's, it's stuff like that. Unfor we call them unforeseen circumstances that force us to change our designs. Other times clients might want to change their mind um, and, you know, we'll just change it. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of reasons to change design. Sometimes you discover that things weren't working. Uh, you wake up in the middle of the night with a realization and you you change something. So it's uh, there's a lot of reasons to change it, but it's, it's not a problem until it's built <laughs> or generally not a problem. Okay. Can't. Uh, this is an additional question to that, I guess. Um, can you tell me about a time when you realized a project was not going in the right way and you had to make a change? Hmm. A lot of examples here. Abby, do you have one on the tip of your tongue? No. <laughs> I, I've, got the, I've got the one on, on, on Garver. When, we, when they tore down um, the West Wall and they realized that what we thought was a concrete wall was actually four layers of brick from the old school that was still there holding up the rest of the stair. Uh, and that was like, whoa, something's wrong here. And we, we had to rethink how to structure that entire elevation. Uh, and that, again, working with our best friends, our structural engineers, decide a new way to frame all of that and change our approach to how that was being supported. So. Um, that was something that happened during construction. Um, but yeah, it was that, that was not going to work the way it was designed and we had to change, change ship and, and make it right. I was uh, working on a project in conceptual design. It's a kind of a conceptual school, so it might not even get built. Um, but we re the client really realized that they wanted to have more security um, when their students were out playing in the play fields. So we actually ended up taking the whole building, flipping it, like mirroring it on the site and then moving the entry into a different position. And luckily, because we use computer programs, we're able to do that pretty quickly and without much headache. But that was something we realized we needed to change and just made the change. Well, thank you for that. Um, so our last question that we have here is, what is your favorite thing about your job? And it'll be cool if we got answers from each of you. Okay. I'll start. It's a little mushy, um, but it's the other three people on the screen, right? It's the people I work with. Um, I think it's, it's <laughs> fun to be around really talented people. Um, I think they energize me and they 
make me excited to do what I want to do. Um, and they're great people to bounce ideas off of. So I just love working with other creative people. Um, and it's what motivates me. Um, I would hate it if I were doing it by myself. I go next. Um, it's a little selfish, but I love seeing the things that I draw get built. For me, it's that kind of what I thought in my head and what I drew down on paper actually becomes the thing that exists in real life. I mean, even to the point where I, I, I get excited about even like planning out my apartment. And when that comes together, I'm really excited about it too, right? It's about the idea of envisioning something and having it not be built, having it not even be real yet, and then making it real. So for me, that's the best part. Yeah, I can second that one. Elijah, you stole that one from me. It would, it would be to see your ideas coming together, even if it's a small portion of it, since we, uh, most of the time we work as, as, as a team, um, it's a combination of ideas, but it can be like the stair um, area or just the comments area or anything like that, that you really put that much effort and thought to and seeing this, um, images and renderings and sketches and nothing coming to life it's 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 pretty great and for me i think it's just that every day is different um you know i've been doing this for over 20 years and like you just you work on different types of buildings you have different types of problems you have new creative ways to deal with the solution um i mean i said like we're constantly like it's like we have all these tools in front of us and we have to pick which tool is the right tool or what solution is the right solution. And so it, it, there's no, like, there's, it's never the same. <laughs> and so that can be scary. That can be a little stressful. Um, but, you know, you're never just repeating anything. And um, I think that to me has always been really fun and it keeps me um, energized and makes me feel, um, you know, creative um, and responsive. To what I'm doing. So, thank you so much. So, um, we really appreciate you all for um, attending, and I'm just going to do a quick um, wrap up. Uh, but we just want to say thank you again to Malam for taking the time out of their day to just come here and be with us and share a lot of cool things about architecture. So, we appreciate you guys um, for joining us today or tonight. Um, so Mesa students, just uh, just a quick heads up about things that are coming up. Sorry, this slide is moving a lot. Okay, so upcoming career visits. So this is um, the first uh, segment of our career visit series. Um, we have the Digimar, Digimar coming up on March 3rd, and then we have Simplexity. These are uh, two um, software companies and product development. Um, so they're going to be coming and sharing us a little bit more about what they do and how you can also be a part of um, that. And so, yeah, we're still um, also scheduling the- Taye? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to correct those dates. Those are actually switched. So March okay. 3rd is Simplexity and April 1st is Digimart. Okay, so opposite uh, of that. And we will have everything updated on uh, the link. Oh, and Bianca, if you could please put the pop-ups. Oh, sure, yeah. 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 And then also opportunities. So we have a demo day coming up. So that's our, as you guys may know, that our annual demo day showcase where students can pre present their projects and get feedback from judges. Um, that will be Saturday, um, February 27th. Um, that will be in afternoon about 1 p.m. to 3. So you can click on the pop-up in the left side of your um, screen to to learn more and to get some information about that. And our next opportunity is open to any high school student. You don't have to be a uh, Mesa student in particular, but we have a summer invention boot camp coming up on um, this summer. So it's a uh, four week long and the application is um, due uh, Sunday, March 7th. So if you click on that and the bottom left side of your computer, um, it will have all the information um, to apply and yeah, so you can send that out to anyone you know may be interested who's a high school student. 
So once again, we want to say thank you, Malam, for being joining us and teaching us about all the things you guys do. And we definitely appreciate um, having us. And thank you all for all those who attended and took time out of your day. Um, we really appreciate you as well. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So that looks like it's the end to our webinar. All right, everyone, have a good night. Good night. Mm-hmm.